is Trek 105 Altegra Tagra X02 Cyclocross bike. Just picked this up and about ready to do the top 20 checklist. Let's see how it fares. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Hello, welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Hanging out with the guy. Hi, I'm Justin, the guy. Obviously, I have a garage shop. Taking scary out of used bikes one bike at a time. If you like these videos, please like and subscribe. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Hanging out with the guy. Hey, I'm Justin, the guy. I'm going to do the top 20 checklist on this Trek X02 bike that I just purchased. I did it in the field. I was going to do it on location, but hey, you know what? It's a little cold outside and I decided like, let's bring it back and get some better lighting on this and do it right. So I purchased this bike today and overall looked really good in the pictures and it is a model and the type of bike I've been looking for to refurbish and, you know, make it in tip top shape for somebody to ride. And what's really cool about this one is the Sockle Cross bike, which is a precursor to your gravel bikes that are out today. So this will make a great entry level bike starting off for somebody to get into road riding. And if they wanted something a little more gravel, this is a diamond and rough right now in the used market. So without further ado, let's check out the top 20 list. Number one is tires. Well, first we want to double check, see if they're aired up, even holding shape. That's a big indication if the person's really motivated to sell this bike and has also been maintained. Some people are like, oh, I aired it up for you to test ride. It should be under assumption that you want to take for a test ride because you're going to want to take for a test ride to make sure it's a bike for you. Uh, so looking at the tires themselves, the front one here, you want to inspect it. Make sure there's no cracks, it's not flat. Um, when it runs smooth, it doesn't have any major hops, any of that nature. It's actually in good shape. Um, looking for any cross checking, which is wear out or any damage on the sides. Same thing for the rear. Also on the rear, when you look directly on the back of it, it'll be a little flat spot. If it's been ridden quite a bit, this one has a little bit, expect that, but you don't want to be seeing any cords coming through. Um, usually most likely you're going to have to replace the tires anyway, because everybody will eventually fall into a realm of what particular tire they like, either Continental Grand Puri, Specialized, uh, armadillo or a Trek Bontrager type tire, some with flat prevention sometimes, or lighter weight, whatever fits your style of riding that you fall into. But start off with, you want at least a tire to last you at least a few rides before you have to make that investment in tires. Tires can run you, you know, anywhere from $20, $25 would be pretty cheap, into Spectrum to $100 a tire. So there's deals to be had out there, but that's what's something you want to be thinking about when you're looking at tires and making sure the wear, the, the wear on the sides are not cross-checking. This particular pair of tires don't match. You might be fine with riding with tires that don't match. That's fine with me personally, but when I'm going to refurbish them, I'm going to have a pair of tires that match. So I'm kind of match match it that way. So the person that's getting the bike is going to be uh, best foot forward when it comes to their tires. Number two, does the wheels spin smoothly? Well, you can pick up the bike if you don't have a stand and see if it runs smoothly right off the bat. You, want, you don't want to have any clunkage or uh, junking sounds. Also, you can feel the vibration through the frame, see if it is very absorbing, like really loud feeling or feels you know, a lot of vibration. Same for the front. Or what you could do is you can take the wheel out if you feel comfortable with taking the quick release off and taking the wheel like this and spinning it and you want it smooth but not tight and you don't want to feel any grinding or notching. Um, if you feel comfortable with that, you can do both wheels. Um, but if you're not comfortable and you're kind of juggling in front of somebody you're buying the bike from, you might want to do that. You might just want to spin the wheel and just kind of see how that feels on that guy. Number three, brakes. Do they feel equal when you pull both of them? Does it, when you look down on the brake pads themselves, are they braking even on the even braking surface? That kind of thing. Looking on the back here, do the pads look like they still have a lot of meat still on them? 
Do they look worn out? Does the rim, do they look like they're lined up with the rim? Do they look like they're going to be safe and you know, be able to stop you? Um, if they feel like they have nothing to them or they look like they've been really worn something, that might be something you want to consider to walk away from or consider that you're going to have to do some repairs or pay for some new pads. Number four, break ca uh, cables and housing. So you want to check the housing and make sure it's not cracked anywhere. Um, it's you know, visually inspected. You can also take a rag and wipe down any dirt um, and look at those, see where they're going through. This one has a top cable routing. Um, what you're looking for, if it's any rust on the, ha on the cables themselves, any tight bends. If you're moving this back and forth, it doesn't bind anywhere to prevent you from turning or cause it to break and abruptly as you're turning. Uh, that's another thing to look at. Also on this one, you look at the cable ends and it has a little end and the cap, or they could be soldered too, which is pretty rare, but can be. These have cable ends, but this one here is frayed and does have a cable end. Most likely your cable is going to need to be replaced. Not an expensive part to replace, but it is kind of expensive to have a shop do it. So you want to make sure you create that cost in your head. Um, this, this cannot be adjusted. Once this is released, you can't reestablish re that cable on there. So you will need to get a new brake cable. They're usually a couple bucks. Number five, what you're looking for is any kind of um, major scuffs, dings, and cracks to the frame, any kind of damage. So using your cloth, I'd go through each tube and inspect it on both sides and to make sure you're running through and looking at the frame, see if there's any of that dirt might wipe off and it turns out to be a crack, including the fork. Um, that's another expensive piece if you need to replace it. But yeah, go through the whole frame, inspect if you see any chips or anything that, and you wanna look at that and make sure it's, you know, nothing's spurring out, any cracks or so forth or any dings. That's what you wanna do initial inspection of the frame when you're looking at it. Number six is checking the chain. I have a fancy chain tool, which looks like this, or you can use a metric uh, a ruler, so you can get, uh, measure it out. Um, you can go by pin by pin, and it should be even up to 12 inches long um, from the center of the pin of the chain, or you can use your chain checker, put it in there real quick, and see with the actual stretch. This will give you the more approximate stretch. This is less than 0.5, which is within that realm. Um, if there's anything longer than that, you know you're going to need to replace the chain. Chains are not really too expensive. It's just an added cost. You're looking about anywhere from you know 15 to 20 bucks up to 50, depending on what kind of level you want to get. Um, but to, it's just it is a cost you're going to have to absorb at some point in a cassette too. So as a quick glance, use a ruler, or if you if you have a chain checker, it's nice to have anyway in your little toolbox from home. Number seven, you're looking at the derailleur. You want to look at the rear derailleur, make sure it doesn't have any impacts on the outside, um, any major scuffs. You want to look at the alignment. Also look at the jockey pulleys too and see if they're not sharp teethed out or not worn out. It doesn't have any cracks and it does run smoothly. So that's what you want to do, a quick inspection of the rear derailleur. Number eight is shifting. So while you're pedaling, if you have a stand up straight or somebody can hold up for you, just go through each of the gears and see if it's going to go through each one of them. This guy seems kind of hesitant, so it might be just the actual cables itself. The shifter itself works like, seems like it's working well. May need to be still cleaned a little bit. Not the best shifting in the world, but I think I can get it to work. Um, if, that, if this was you and you didn't know how to do adjustments or derailleurs, that drive chain would have to be addressed. Um, the shifting is not smooth, it's not crisp, doesn't go in all the gears. It's going to probably need some adjustments to the drive train, which most bike shops are going to just talk you into doing a full tune-up when it gets to that price. Because it, you know, a couple other things, before you know it, you're already at that price level for a tune-up. Number nine, the headset. Here you want it to be smooth. And hitting the front tire, you shouldn't hear very much of a vibration. Another thing too is put this on the ground, hit the front brake, rocking back and forth, look at, making sure it's not knocking to be loose. If it's too tight, it will bind up somewhere. This one seems like it flows pretty well. You can just pick this up off the ground and just kind of see how it does. On older bikes, if it starts notching, like that means the bearings are pitted inside the cones 
and the, the cups, and that means it needs to be replaced. This one seems to be okay. This particular model has a cartridge design. Those cartridges are a lot um, more sturdier and long, they last longer. So this one's probably in really good shape. Number 10, bar tape um, and grips. You know, this one has a pretty good, you know, bar tape. It is a bond tracker, which is specific to track, but I can tell it wasn't wrapped by, um, it's not a very clean wrapping, so I knew they did it themselves or somebody did it themselves on the, on the race. So it was an original OEM, but I don't see any scuffs or any kind of indications there's been accidents to it. It just needs a new bar tape. I replace them, each one. Outside of cost, you might as well just put it in your head anyway that you're gonna have to put it into the bike, tires and bar tape. Reason being is bar tape, it's kind of nasty as soon as else's, I don't know. It's just something we use when we replace. You don't want to wear somebody else's socks, right? No, um, yeah, make sure you get this re you replaced. It's not too hard to install yourself. If not, bike shops don't really charge too much to, for the labor to install them. Um, once you put the bar tape on there, it's gonna give you a more comfortable ride. There's a variety starting from like 15 bucks on up. The more expensive ones have a gel padded to them, which is kind of nice for those longer rides. So kind of do your research on bar tape and see something you particularly like and try some different ones out when you need them to have them rewrapped. Not, not a bad idea. Number 11, make sure the bike is able to be test ridden. If you get this bike and you're like, oh, the tires are flat or something's not right, the braking doesn't seem like it doesn't shift or anything like that, walk away. It's something that you don't want to invest into if you're not prepared for that lift. When you're looking at tune-ups, they're going to cost you anywhere between 100 to 200 parts in, in labor and parts on top of that. So, you know, it's something that you want to, if you're looking at used, you're still going to have to put some money into it. You don't want, the person's not putting their best foot forward to sell it. That means they really didn't take care of it. And unfortunately, if it's not rideable, unless you're, you know, know that you're just buying for parts or what have you for some other reason, you want it to be able to ride it when you take it, when you look at it and take it for a test ride. Make sure it's safe and it's the right size. Number 12, look at the rims. Um, this one you want to make sure it's uh, flat. You can put a straight edge on there or a ruler and see if it's uh, flat. Um, rim brakes, what happens over time, they wear that rim down and gets more of an indentation on them. It's going to be more pronounced on the rear wheel because that's where most of your weight is and that's where most of your lockup braking is. You want to look at that and looking at this particular one the rim kind of pops over a little bit and uh, kind of hits that brake pad that means the wheel needs to be trued another cost somebody's gonna to have to go in and true that wheel and also you want to have your rag with you and go through around the, the rear if it's a lot of these especially the rear um, because the rear takes the most of the hits when you're riding and has most of the weight of the rider on there and what you're looking for is any kind of damage on the rim as well as any kind of um, you know damage around the spokes and on this one when I was testing and ch checking in the field I found some very micro hairline cracks in one of the spoke nipples. So this particular rim, since I was a service manager when these were new, there was a problem with these rims. So I keep an eye out for them when I'm actually looking at bikes. This wheel, it's toast. It's not cost effective to find a rim, which if you even can, to, re to relace it, it's time to just get a new rear wheel. Most people are fine with just getting one re new rear wheel. I like refurbishing bikes in the sense that a matchy matchy, tires are going to match, as well as the wheels. So I want them to or at least the same brand. So you're not gonna get two funky wheels. I kind of knew that in the, in the beginning on this one because this one has a Bond Tracker race rear and also a select front. Kind of got hodgepodge. I was already thinking in my head, I might have to invest in a new wheel set on this anyway. But checking that rear wheel, I'm not gonna be able to resell that to kind of overcompensate my costs. So that's something I, got to, that I had to take in consideration when I was purchasing this bike. Number 13, check in the bottom bracket. So what you can do is pull this chain down, lay it on the frame, make sure the shifting is in the low setting so it's out of the way. So you can spin this and where you're feeling, if there's any vibration or if it runs smoothly. This one binds up a little bit, so that bearing set might need to be replaced. Bearing sets are not too expensive. Again, labor intensive. So what you're looking at is a labor cost that's going to be equal to, if not exceed the cost of the part itself. You can get bottom bracket cups, you know, they're 
I don't know, in between 25, 30 bucks, somewhere around there for 40 for decent ones. Uh, but the labor on that, the bottom right, you gotta pull the whole thing apart and put it upside down and have specialty tools. That's gonna cost you money for labor. Or you can go online and look at all the videos and figure it out yourself, but then again, that's an investment that you'll have to put into tools because these are specialty tools to remove the crank as well as the cup set. And they all vary between the different ones and different models and different years. So just don't think you're buying that one tool and you're set for every bike. No, over the years they keep changing them, so you gotta constantly keep changing tools. So if you don't wanna put that investment into it, that's fine. But if you want to do it and have it for yourself, that's fine too. I'm an advocate of trying it. If it doesn't work out, then you can take it to the shop, you know? But, you know, one of those things, it's always, you know, make sure it's safe. You know, you could probably ride on it for a while. Um, it's not gonna damage too much, but, you know, it's gonna slow you down. <laughs> Who wants to be slow riding a bike, right? Number 14, seat post. So we want to, oh boy, put this open up. And we want to check the seat post. Loosen this up, it's good to have the Allen wrench with you. I hope they didn't cut this one, please don't be cut, please don't be cut. Okay, let's see. Wow. All right, I have a max line, which is awesome. And the round the edge here looks like it's manufactured, cut and uh, anodized. So this one has not been cut, which is great. But some of these people with the high end seat posts like this with Thompson, Thompson's, <laughs> they'll cut them for weight for which is a ridiculous reason. But you want to be able to do that. Also, while you're here, you want to inspect, which is the next one here is number 15 is make sure the collar is clean. Um, no cracks or anything of that nature. And when you put it back in, make sure it goes down past that height limit line to ensure safety. And you're all set. So. Number 16, looking at the stem, making sure it is not exceeding the height of the steer tube. So the quick check that sometimes you can see through the gap with a little flashlight and see if that metal part of the steer tube is sticking over the top binder bolt, or you can release this cap real quick. Take a look and inspect, make sure it is in the proper position. If it isn't, you know you'll need to switch out some spacers um, to make that accommodating for that to make sure it's safe. If it's not, it's fine. Just don't write it until you actually get that switched out so it's set up correctly. And number 17 is to flip the bike upside down to inspect the frame like underneath here, the seat stays. You can put it on the ground upside down underneath here. You'll find sometimes damage from car racks and so forth. So you wanna double check that, make sure there's nothing that's going to compromise the strength and integrity of the frame. Also double check, which is, you know, uh, making sure there's no damages or dings on top of the serial number is in that position too. Ah. So the serial number, usually it's underneath this portion here. Um, let's see if I can get a better angle uh, here. So, a serial number sometimes will be a sticker or will be actually stamped into the bottom bracket area. On some bikes, um, some niche brands will have them stamped in the back of the dropout too. So there's a couple different places to look for that as well. And number 19, it's always good to bring a cloth and some either a bottle of water to spray on a rag or some cleaner. Windex would work just to kind of enable to clean the little spots, make sure there's no damage in all those and check the bottle cages and that kind of thing when you're looking through it. Um, that would be a big testimonial, especially if you're looking underneath, it's a lot of dirt and grime. They wiped off the top, but then you get the bottom of it. It's kind of like a hidden secret kind of thing. If you do flip it upside down and it's really clean, that means they've been really well maintained and really double check their bike. And number 20, size. Ooh, size is always a tricky one. This one isn't stamped as well so you won't see like a small medium large or uh, like a 54 56 60 you know 57 centimeter kind of measurement so 
The number one thing you want to do when you look at a bike is, okay, do a little bit of homework, research that brand and model and year, and see if you can find some size charts. And to determine if it's the original owner, most likely will know the size of the bike. If it isn't, if it's you know second or third owner, they may not know for sure. So your measurements are you're looking at is the seat tube collar to the center. And this one looks measuring out to like about a 59. Also, you can measure this out here on the top tube, and this is a 58. So if I went to the spec sheet from Trek on this particular model and year, I should be able to determine what size. And then I can look at a size chart to see if it's gonna be appropriately sized for me. So in that perspective is one thing. Also another thing to look at is the head tube. The head tube here, if this is measured out, when I look on geometrygeeks.com, this head tube will determine um, the size like this one's 18 and each one has its own size, which makes it a little bit easier to uh, figure out that kind of thing. So that's your top 20 list. Um, and again, those all little things can add up and get pretty expensive. So you want to make sure you're at least in the know when you're purchasing that used bike. Um, not so specifically for road bikes, but a lot of these do carry over to the mountain bikes as well. So if you have any uh, issues or questions about that, you want to make sure you can take it to the shop after you purchase it if need to be addressed and have them do an estimate as well. But those are the things to look for when you're looking at used. If all those things check out to be pretty clear, you may have yourself a jam on your hands, a unicorn per se. So good luck out there. If you like videos like this, please like and subscribe. And uh, I'll see you again. Have a wonderful day from the garage.